In this video, we're going to do another example where we use algebra and calculus to help us sketch the graph of a curve. Recall our graphing strategy. From algebra, we are going to get the domain of the curve or the function, the intercepts, and look at any symmetry that the curve might have. Using both algebra and calculus, we are going to look for any vertical asymptotes or horizontal asymptotes, or maybe even a slant asymptote. And using calculus, we're going to look for intervals of increase and decrease, any local maxima or minima. We will look for intervals where the curve is concave up, where it's concave down, and any points of inflection. So the curve we're going to look at now is y equals the cube root of x over quantity 2 minus x. We'll start with the domain. We can't have 0 in the denominator. And so that's telling me that our domain is all real numbers except positive 2. And the way we write that is using set builder notation. We would read this as x such that x does not equal 2. The only intercept we have is uh, when x equals 0, y equals 0 as well. And if we want to check the symmetry, remember the test is to replace x with negative x simplify and see if we either get the same thing we started with or the algebraic opposite. And in this case, I get the opposite on top, but the bottom has 2 plus x, which is not the opposite of 2 minus x. It only changes the sign on the x, but not on the 2. So there's uh, no symmetry. It's neither even nor odd. So we certainly have a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. To find any horizontal asymptote, we need to evaluate the limit as x goes to infinity of the cube root of x over 2 minus x. And we'll change cube root of x to x raised to the power of 1 third. So the highest power of x in this expression is 1. So to help us evaluate it, I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by 1 over x. So now I'll have the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x to the power of 2 thirds over quantity 2 over x minus 1. And we know that uh, as x goes to infinity, 1 over x goes to 0. And we can use the limit laws then to say that the numerator is going to 0. 2 over x is going to 0. And that's just going to leave me with 0 over negative 1, which is 0. Now we have to think, uh, could we get a different answer if x goes towards negative infinity? And you can see that uh, in this case, there would be no changes. And so the only horizontal asymptote is uh, y equals 0. So let's put all that information here in the margin so we can focus on the next part, which involves the first derivative. So to help us calculate the first derivative, Again, I'll rewrite cube root of x with a fractional exponent. Taking the derivative, I'll use the quotient rule. So the derivative of the top is 1 third x raised to the power of negative 2 thirds times the bottom 2 minus x. Then subtract the derivative of the bottom is negative 1. And I'll multiply that times the top, which is x to the one-third. 
that whole thing is divided by 2 minus x quantity squared. So now we have to do some algebra. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take any expressions that have negative exponents and we're going to rewrite those as fractions with positive exponents. So in this case, the x to the negative 2 thirds, I'm going to bring that down into a fraction in the denominator of a fraction with a positive exponent. So once I do that, now I have a complex fraction. And I'm going to simplify that by multiplying top and bottom by well, the only denominator I have is 3x to the power of 2 thirds. I'll have to use the distributive property in the numerator. x to the 1 third times x to the 2 thirds. Remember, add the exponents. 1 third plus 2 thirds gives me 1. So x to the power of 1 is just x, and I still have them 3 multiplied by x. And then in the first term, uh, the 3x to the 2 thirds divided by itself is 1. 1 times any number just gives me that number back again. So I'm just left with 2 minus x. And then in the uh, denominator, um, I just multiply right each uh, factor 3x to the 2 thirds parentheses 2 minus x squared. So I can collect the like terms in the numerator. And in fact, I can factor out a 2. And so now let's see if we can use that factored form of the derivative to investigate where the a function or curve is increasing and where it is decreasing. So we can see that we have two critical numbers. The derivative is 0 when x equals negative 1. So that is a critical number. And then 0 belongs to the domain of the function. Uh, only uh, 2 is not in the domain. So 0 is in the domain, but the derivative is undefined when x equals 0. And we also have to be aware that, uh, that we have a vertical asymptote when x equals 2. So it's possible that the uh, function could have a different behavior to the left of 2 and to the right of 2. So we'll need to include that in our investigation. So we're going to make a little table. We don't always have to do this. You can do it as, um, mentally, uh, but I'll put it out here to make it clear what we're doing. So we're going to take a number from our first interval. So these uh, numbers here break up the realign into four intervals. So the first interval is from negative infinity to negative 1. I'll choose a test value there. Negative 2 is a fine number. And then I'm just going to look at the sign of these factors that I have in the factored form of the derivative. Well, I know that um, three x to the two thirds power. Uh, well, x to the two thirds power is the cube root of x squared. So that part's going to be always positive. And I see I have a slight mistake here, and I'll correct it. That's still two minus x quantity squared. So that's also going to be positive. So really, the only thing I need to check is the sign of x plus 1. Is it positive or negative for my test number? And in this case, it's negative. And so I can see that uh, the derivative is going to be negative on that interval. And the 
Let's move on to the next interval. Between negative one and zero, I'll choose a test value of negative one half. Uh, now we have all positives. And in fact, for the remaining two intervals, I have all positives. And so we are only decreasing on one interval and all of the other intervals we are increasing. So we can say that we're increasing from negative one to zero, from zero to two, and from two to infinity. And we are decreasing from negative one, negative infinity to negative one. So let's put that in our margin. Oh, before we do that, uh, this critical number when x equals negative one corresponds to a local min. We're decreasing then increasing. And going back to the original equation, if I replace x with negative one, I get y equals negative one third. Now at x equals zero, the derivative is undefined. So I'm going to have a vertical tangent line. And that happens to be our only intercept too. When x equals zero, y equals zero as well. Now let's put that information in the margin and explore the second derivative. Now taking the second derivative is a bit of work. I'll recognize that because we have to use the quotient rule for the derivative overall, but then when it's time to take the derivative of the bottom, I have to use the product rule. So the derivative of the top is simple, it's just two. Then I have to multiply that times the entire denominator minus the top, which is my two x plus two, times the derivative of the bottom in these brackets. Now in the brackets, I've had to use the product rule in order to calculate the derivative of the bottom there. Uh, after I do that, of course, I have to square the bottom. So 3 squared is 9. When I take x to the 2 thirds power and square it, I get x to the 4 thirds. And then 2 minus x squared squared again is going to be 2 minus x to the power of 4. Now, our next step is to rewrite any expressions that have negative exponents as fractions with positive exponents. And the only negative exponent we have here is the x to the negative one third power. So I'll rewrite that particular term as two parentheses two minus x squared over x to the positive one third power. I cleaned up the multiplicative factors here. So I had a negative one. So now I have a subtraction here. Two times three will give me six. And same with the very first term in the numerator. Two times three gives me six. Next, I want to clear the fractions. And so the only denominator I have is the x to the one third. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by x to the one third. Now, when I use the distributive property here, I will distribute the x to the one third inside my brackets here. But since I did the inside the brackets, I don't need to distribute it to the multiplying factor 2x plus 2 outside the bracket. I still need to multiply it, though, times my first term. And so when I multiply x to the one third times 6x to the two thirds, I'll add the exponents and that's just going to give me 6x. And that's true here as well. And then for inside the brackets with the first term, the x to the one third power will divide to make one. So after doing that, I get uh, A nicer expression, I've got um, all polynomials except for in the denominator. Now, 
I multiplied one third x to the one third times x to the four thirds, added the exponents, and that's how I got x to the five thirds. I'll still need to do some uh, removing parentheses and collecting like terms, but before I do that, I can notice that everything has a factor of two minus x. So I'm gonna take a two minus x out of the first term. And then in the brackets, I'm gonna take one of the two minus x factors out and then the two minus x factor out in the second term. So if I factor that out, then I'll put inside braces what's left over. I have six x times just a factor of two minus x minus parentheses two x plus two. And inside the brackets now I have two and then parentheses two minus x and then just minus six x. And then I'll take one of the factors of two minus x out of the numerator. That will leave me with nine times x to the power of five thirds times parentheses two minus x to the power of three. So these will divide to make one. And I can start to remove parentheses and collect like terms. Now, when I do that, in the end, I have a quadratic polynomial, 10x squared plus 20x minus eight in the numerator. In the denominator, I have the nine times x to the power of five thirds times parentheses two minus x cubed. So if I set that equal to zero, remember that a fraction can only be zero when the numerator is zero and the denominator is not zero. So I will set that quadratic polynomial to zero. I can factor out two, so there's a common factor of two, but then I'll have to use the quadratic formula. And so my solutions simplify to negative five plus or minus three radical five all over five. Which now I'm going to use my calculator. Those two solutions are about negative 2.34 and 0 0.34 and taking those x values and substituting them back into the original equation I find their y coordinates at uh, to be zero, negative 0 0.31 and 0 0.42. Great, why did we do all of that? We did all of that because we're trying to find the values of x where the concavity could change. So we're gonna make a number line. The values of x where the concavity could change would be at negative 2.3 and 0 0.3, we found that. We had that vertical tangent line when x equals zero, we can see that our second derivative is not defined when x equals zero. And we have that vertical asymptote at x equals two, so the concavity may be different to the left of two versus to the right of two. So we'll need to test that as well. So we'll make a table like we did with the first derivative. We're going to break this up now into five intervals, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five intervals. Take a test number from each. We are going to put it into this expression here and try to evaluate the sign. Now, the only thing that we may have to be careful about is the uh, quadratic expression um, because we'll know that um, the 9x to the 5 thirds power is negative only when x is negative and 2 minus x cubed is going to be uh, negative whenever x is smaller than 2. So that'll help us a little bit. 
So not going to spend too much time explaining each one of these steps is the same idea. I pick a number in the interval from negative infinity to negative 2.3. Maybe negative 3 is a good number. And I find that the uh, numerator is positive. Since x is negative, the first factor in the denominator is negative, And the second factor is going to be positive. And so that tells me that the sign of the second derivative is negative. I'm concave down from negative infinity to negative 2.3. Then I'll move on to the next interval. My test number between negative 2.3 and 0 is negative 1. And it turns out that the concavity there uh, is, well, that the second derivative is positive, so it's concave up. Then I have a small interval, interval between 0 and 0 0.3. I'll choose 0 0.1 as my test number, and I find that the sign of the second derivative is negative. And then I'll go to the next interval, and I find that the second derivative is positive. And in the last interval, that's when we cross over that vertical asymptote, the concavity changes again it's going to be concave down. So uh, it's interesting that uh, when we looked at the first derivative, there was only one change in sign. It went from negative to positive, and then it was positive everywhere else. But here we are changing concavity. The second derivative changes sign uh, in every interval. So we can say that we're concave up on the intervals from negative 2.3 to 0 and from 0 0.3 to 2. We're concave down from negative infinity to 2, negative 2.3, from 0 to 0 0.3, and then from 2 to infinity. And that tells me it must have some points of inflection. And oh, one is going to be at negative 2.3, negative 0 0.3. These are estimates that I got from my calculator, uh, which is going to be fine for what our goal is here. Our goal is to actually sketch the graph. Uh, the origin is also going to be in a point of inflection. Uh, 0 0.3 comma 0 0.4 is another point of inflection. And even though the concavity changes from the left of 2 to the right of 2, we can't have any point of inflection because the function is undefined there. We have that vertical asymptote when x equals 2. So now we put all of our information over here in the margin. And we've drawn our axes. We've labeled them. This is our y-axis, our x-axis. And so now the question is, what should we do about the scale? When I look at our numbers here, you know, our x-coordinates uh, that are important to us, certainly x equals 2 is where we have a vertical asymptote. Um, we have an, another critical uh, number at uh, x equals negative 1. Uh, and I also have some in points of inflection at negative 2.3. So what I'm going to do on the uh, horizontal axis is I'm going to go ahead and use uh, four squares to represent one unit. Um, the y coordinates, um, the min value that I have, that local min is negative one third. The y coordinates of my points of inflection are 0 0.4 and negative 0 0.3. Uh, so I really don't need uh, to go much beyond uh, negative 1 to positive 1. So I'm going to use 5 units to represent, uh, 5 squares to represent 1 unit. So um, what's our next step? Well, let's plot the points that we know are important to us. And we'll draw the asymptotes. So I have my vertical asymptote at x equals 2, 
the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote. I have that local min at negative 1 comma negative 1 third. I have an inflection point at about negative 2.3 um, negative 0 0.3 and then there's another inflection point at uh, 0 0.3 comma 0 0.4. So actually, that is not 0 0.4. Let me fix that. And come in here. Let me fix that 0. See, this is 0 0.4. Maybe right there, 0 0.3. more like right there. So then the next thing I'd want to do is note that, okay, this is a local min. So let me go ahead and draw kind of a local min there. At zero comma zero, I know I have a vertical tangent line. So let me make a short vertical line to remember that. The other two are inflection points. And in fact, I'm concave down to the, on the left of this and then concave up. So I'll draw kind of a little note there. Here I'm going to be um, concave down and I'll pass through that point and be concave up. And so that's going to guide me certainly on uh, the left part. I know that uh, as I go towards negative infinity, the curve has to get close to the x-axis. As I go, get, go to positive infinity, the curve has to go to get close to the x-axis as well. So now let's see if I can attempt to draw a smooth curve that would have that information. So I'm concave down here, getting close to the x-axis. I'm concave up and having a local min then I have to turn sharply upward to have that vertical tangent line go to concave down switch back to concave up oops not a very smooth curve if we can fix that up. And then it should get close to the uh, vertical asymptote, but that's one of the downsides of um, using uh, five squares to represent one unit. Um, in order to get this detail down here with the inflection points, um, I need to uh, sacrifice uh, seeing the curve actually get very close to the uh, vertical asymptote. Now, on the right side of our vertical asymptote, what do I know? Well, I know that I, the function is increasing. I know it's concave down. I know it has to get close to the x-axis. I know that there's no critical numbers over here. Uh, so it's got to smoothly come from the up along the vertical asymptote to approach the uh, horizontal asymptote. So that information alone should tell me that all the y coordinates should be negative. But I can go back to the original equation and say, oh, when x is bigger than 2, 2 minus x is negative, but the top is positive. And so, yes, the y values will always be negative. So I'm just going to try to sketch a smooth curve here that shows that behavior. And that was a long journey, but we, in the end, we were able to capture all of the important information on the graph.